of maps, and it's very convenient to have a map if you're going somewhere and you don't know how to get there. If we look on this map, we'll see where we are right now. I'll show you guys. We are right here. We are today on this map. You see, we're right there on the map. This map tells us how to get to other places, but the first thing you have to know is where you are now to get where you want to go. That's right. When you're using the map. You have to know where you are now, you know where you want to go. So as Christians, we need to know where we are and where we want to go. Now, we don't use this kind of map to get to heaven and see God. Instead, we have a very special map. Do you know what this is? What is this? It's a Bible. This Bible is our road map to heaven. So it's very important if you want to go to be with God in heaven, that you study this very carefully and learn it. Because this is the way, this is the word of God, and this is what we need to heaven. Father, we thank you for your Bible that gives us the road map of the way to heaven. We can all go there. And anyone, any human being, if they truly, truly want to go to heaven, they can use that map to get there. And if we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. He's been coming first. Because then he's the You ready, guys? We have Colton Nash with us today. He's the Flash, I'm sorry. I know better. Colton Flash. He has been with us for quite a while. We're happy to have him back. I've been looking forward to this day all summer long. So thank you, Colton. All right, so glad. Uh, my praise. Oh, good morning. Good morning. How are we all today? Bless. Oh, that's good to hear. Uh, it's going to be kind of a weirder sermon. I kind of wanted to do something different than usual. So we're going to be starting in uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Okay, can you repeat? Exodus, chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then we're going to be bouncing around from there, so don't get too comfortable. <laughs> okay. I'm hating it. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll pray first, and then we'll be in the morning. Dear Lord, thank you again today for giving me this opportunity as you did it a few times before. It's good to be back. Uh, I pray for everyone's well-being here today and that was not here and I have a chance to come and see you. And uh, I hope that this word is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, we'll start with the Bible verse. Exodus chapter 3 says, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And, the God, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, that is what you shall say to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Now as I sat down to write about what I wanted to talk about this Sunday, I was having a bit of trouble. Not because there isn't a lot to talk about, but because I didn't really feel pushed in any sort of direction. So, I just started searching random things on Google and looking through old files, just trying to find a little bit of inspiration. And I came across a paper I did last semester at college, speaking on the various names of God throughout the Old and New Testament. So today, I would like to speak for just a little while on that subject, and the names of God. This will be somewhat of a crash course for those of you who do not know the incredible names that are, the names and titles that are beyond simply God and and Jesus, and we'll be bouncing around from story to story to illustrate and focus on certain names. You'll have to forgive my Hebrew. Not the best at it. <laughs> names in the Bible, though, they have meaning. 
<coughs> Biblical names show the character of the one who possesses the name. Several times you'll find that as God changes the character of a man, he changes the name of that man to fit his new character. Jacob is an example of this. Uh, his name means supplanter or deceiver. A name he lived up to when he supplanted his brother Esau and deceived his father Isaac. But when he wrestled with God, when he got a hold of God, and when God changed him, God renamed him to Israel, which means a prince with power, or a prince with God. <coughs> this is a principle found throughout the Bible, and it does not end with the names of mankind. We find Satan in the book of Job standing before God and accusing Job of countless issues. It's no wonder that the name Satan itself means accuser of the brethren. Names reveal the nature and character of the one named. And after the fall of man and after the flood, we find a people in the Bible who did not know God. Little by little, God began to reveal himself to mankind as they began to call upon. One way God showed man his character was through names. In our text, Moses asked God for his name, and God answered with, I am. It means the all-sufficient one, or the self one Genesis calls him the God who provides, when Abraham said God would provide a man instead of his son Isaac. In Exodus, he is the God who heals. Leviticus calls him Elohim Kedoshim, the holy God. He is pure spotless, perfect, and free from sin. In Deuteronomy, he is called the God of the beginning, the one who is before all things, and who made all things. He is called the Mohai Elohim, the God of gods. <coughs> Nehemiah calls him the God of my forgiveness, and Psalms, the God of kindness, the God of my strength, the God of salvation, and the God of my praise. God, in the Old Testament, has many of these names, each revealing a part of his nature, a part of his character. But though they are the names of God, they are not the name of God, if you get what I'm saying. The angel of the Lord made this clear when he appeared to Noah, who is the father of Samson, promising him that he would be born. In Judges chapter 13, it says, And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may be thee honored? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why ask for my name, after seeing that it is secret? We know that the angel of the Lord is none other than a manifestation of God himself. Because Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. And he would not tell them his name. Jacob had a similar experience with God when God renamed him Israel. For God will not tell him his name after being asked, and instead blessing him after the name. Zechariah also says that the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and in that day that there shall be one Lord and his name one. And one day it happened. An angel told Joseph in a dream, not to worry about the fact that Mary was with child, because this was not any ordinary child. This was to be a special one. Jesus means Yahweh's salvation. And when he was about 30 years old, Jesus began to live up to his name. He was Emmanuel, God with us. God, who had been separated from mankind by their sin, was now with us in the flesh. Jesus was also the God who is near, or Elohe Mukherov. <laughs> Sorry, Hebrew's not the best. Uh, Jesus is also the I Am. He began working a miracles among his people. He turned water into wine at a wedding feast. He was Yahweh Nisi, the God of miracles. I'm telling you, Jesus was more than just a man, more than just a prophet. He is more than just a religious figure of some old religion. He was God with us. When he opened the eyes of the blind and healed all matters of disease, he was the God who heals. To illustrate this specific name, let us look to the Gospel of Mark and the story of the woman who was sick. We'll be starting in Mark 5.25. A woman 
who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead became worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she had been saying to herself, if I had just touched his garment, I will get well. This woman had tried everything else, and nothing else had worked. She was bankrupt. She had no money, and she had no hope. She was unclean under Levitical law, but when she saw Jesus, something stirred within her. Somehow she knew he was more than just a man. Somehow she felt in her innermost being that this was the one. This was the answer to her prayers. The crowds were all around Jesus, but she somehow pressed her way in, just thinking that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be made whole. Now, under Levitical law, all Israelite men wore a, wore a, a tonit, which is a, a shawl with blue boards. Uh, Orthodox Jews still kind of wear them today. Uh, on the on the corner of these tallit are tassels, which I think have a great name called sitsits. Uh, tradition tells us that the Jews use these tassels much like we use checks today. Uh, they wove their names into the tassels, and when buying something, would place the tassel in the clay, leaving the imprint of their name. Jesus most likely wore such a garment. And when that woman was saying to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, she most likely met this shawl. Could it be that when she reached out and touched the hem of his garment that she got a hold of his name? And the moment she touched this garment, she was healed. Continuing on with verse 29, it says, And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power from him had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And as he looked around to see the woman who'd done this, the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Now Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. Ain't that incredible? That, the, that we have a God willing to perform these acts as a God of miracles and to fix those who are sick and wounded as the God who heals. Another story, still in the Gospel of Mark, highlights yet another new name for the day. One that we need now, probably more than ever. Uh, Mark chapter four, 4, starting with verse 37, says, And a fierce gale of wind developed, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling with water. And yet Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not see that we are perishing? So he got up and rebuked the winds, and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? What manner of man is this? It's because he was more than just a man. The God who made the heavens and the seas, the Spirit of God incarnate, the same Spirit that moved upon the face of the waters on the very first day of creation, Yahweh Shalom, the God of peace, spoke to the raging storm. It must have been a terrible storm to upset the 12 men who knew the seas, some of whom were professional fishermen. It must have been a hurricane. They thought they were going to die. But Yahweh Shalom arose from where he had been sleeping, looked calmly out at the raving storm, his voice piercing the rolling thunder and the crashing waves, commanding, be still. When the God of peace spoke to the storms, they obeyed. One moment the storms were raging, and the next the wind falls silent 
the sea went calm as glass. The rain stopped falling and the dark clouds parted, all because of Jesus and his power. When a blind man came to Jesus, Jesus formed clay from the dust of the ground in his own spit and put it on the man's eyes. Why do you think he did this? He did this because once his father formed an entire man of clay in the Garden of Eden. He is Yahweh Osimim, <laughs> the Lord, our Maker. He told the man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he did, the man's eyes were healed. You see, the man's old eyes did not work, so the Lord, our Maker, simply made him another set. When a leper came to see him, a man unclean, a man unholy under Levitical law, a man to be shunned, kept out of the city, a man who could not be touched or could not touch others without making them unholy. When he came to Jesus, he fell to his feet, crying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. I'm sure many drew away from him in repulsion, knowing if they touched them, they too would be made unholy. Leprosy was a terrible disease, a disease that kept a man from his family, from the temple of God, from the feast of Israel, and from worship. But Jesus touched him, and there at that moment, something happened that had never happened before in the history of the world. That which was holy touched something that was unholy, and the unholy thing was made holy. It should have been the other way around. But Jesus was more than a man. He was the God who makes holy. And a last couple set of stories here. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, and a friend to Jesus, had died. I'm sure we've all heard this story before. Jesus arrived on the scene as far as everyone was concerned, too late to do any good. But you see, Jesus is never late. Martha fell at his feet, weeping, saying, Lord, if you had only been there, my brother would not have died. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. When Mary showed up, Jesus had asked where they had laid Lazarus' body. He went with them to the tomb. He ordered the men there to roll away the stone from the tomb, but Martha had said, Lord, he has been dead four days, and by this time he smells of decay. But they still rolled away the stone, and sure enough, the scent of death fell in the air. Lazarus was truly dead, his body already in states of decay. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the God of life. He stood there, ignoring that stench of decay, ignoring the unbelief of those watching, and he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus. Had he not said Lazarus specifically, had he simply said, come forth, I am sure that every grave in that graveyard would have opened up. Every dead body, no matter how long decayed, would have sprung to life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the God of life. He told John in Revelation that I am he that has lived and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. And I have the keys of hell and of death. In a few more stories, the people brought to Jesus a woman taken in the very act of adultery. They told Jesus, wanting to trick him, that, that the Levitical law said that she should be stoned to death. God is the God of justice, after all. The woman cowered there before Jesus, humiliated ashamed and afraid of what might happen next. She laid there, her sin revealed for all the world to see, at the feet of the God of justice. But, Jesus also is the God of forgiveness. Jesus said, let those who are without sin pass the first stone. One by one, ashamed, the accusers left our God of justice. The woman who had been a sinner she was Mary, the sister of Lazarus. She had been a woman of ill repute. Sometime after this, Jesus was at the house of Simon the Pharisee. 
Simon had not washed his feet, he had not anointed Jesus with oil, and he had not given him the customary kiss of friendship. They were sitting, eating, and discussing when Jesus, or when Mary, my bad, came silently in. She approached quietly, what I assumed her ears burning, her face cast down, aware of what everyone must be thinking. She knew she had been a terrible sinner, but this Jesus, this wonderful Jesus, her Lord had delivered her from that life. She was there to worship and to praise him. She took a jar filled with expensive perfume oil and she broke it. She anointed Jesus with it and his hands and his feet. Simon had not anointed him, but she did. Weeping, she washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. Why? Because Mary knew who he was. The Pharisees did not know who was in their midst, but she knew. She knew that this was more than just a man. This was the God of my prayers. You may not want to worship him every day. You may not want to praise him. You may not esteem him worthy of honor and of praise. But I, to me, he is also the God of my praise. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. In conclusion, the many countless names for our God and His Holy Son all highlight or focus on parts of the complete picture of why we worship the way we do and who these holy beings truly are. So when we need strength, we have the Almighty God. When healing is needed, we have the Great Physician. When authority is required, we have the King of Kings. And when peace is lacking, we have the Prince peace. And above all, in all things, we have the love and joy of God. Thank you.